So welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. Um, we're going to be talking this afternoon about the ECSE program, telling you a bit about what uh, the ECSE program is and how you can apply. So in a minute I'm going to hang over to my colleague Lorna Smith, also here with us. I have a few gal from EPCC and my name is Chris Johnson. So during the session, um, if you have any questions, uh, there'll be lots of time for questions at the end, so feel free to ask then. Um, if you want, you can uh, type questions into the chat uh, and then we'll spot them and we'll do our best to answer them as we go along. Um, or if, if better, then we'll just answer them at the end. But uh, feel free to either put them into the chat or just ask at the end. And if you have any problems during the session, I know sometimes there are audio problems or um, you, know, you can't see the slides or something, then just type into the chat session and one of us will keep an eye on that as we go through and, and try and fix things up um, as best we can. Uh, so I'll hand over now to my colleague Lorna um, and we'll start the slides. So hopefully everyone can see the slides. Just let us know if, if you can't. You should see one saying ECSE overview right now. So I'll pass you over to Lorna. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Can people hear me now? Yes, yeah. okay. Thank you. So I'm going to take you through an overview of the ECSE. This is information on what you need to do to apply. Um, any questions, just type them in the chat or interrupt. So if I move on to... I'm afraid the slides are quite slow to move on. Well, okay, so this is an overview of the main objectives of the ECSE program. It's worthwhile keeping these in mind when you write your application. So the funding is there to provide Archer, the Archer user community, um, to allow the Archer user community to develop software in a sustainable manner for Archer. So we're looking to sustain key codes for the UK computational science community. We're looking to facilitate efficient use of Archer resources um, by enhancing code performance or functionality. And it's worth noting that this is a not-for-profit service. So um, we look to provide the best value for money and any extra money is put back into the community or for extra funding. We have a particular focus on trying to develop codes and communities from new scientific areas and I'll talk a little bit about that in one of the following slides because it's an important area and we're also keen to support and encourage early career researchers we find this is often a way for somebody to have their first co-i position for example or even first pi position so people often ask what what do we really mean by those objectives? What can and can I, can I not do? Some examples of things that are that we get requests for and that, that get funded are, for example, implementing algorithmic improvements to an existing code. So changing the code to improve it in some way, either to enable better science or simply to be able to do the same science more and with a more efficient use of resources. Um, we often have projects which are looking to improve the scalability of software so that it, it can exploit larger core counts. Improvements to code which allow new science to be carried out. So, uh, you know, the code is only we're limited at the moment to doing this. And if we made these improvements, then we'd be able to do new science. Porting and optimizing code just to run efficiently on Archer. Adding new functionality to existing codes. Um, or, for example, taking codes which are currently running on say, a regional centre to bring them up to the national level to be able to exploit Archer. So this isn't limited to uh, people who are currently on Archer. It may be that you're using a regional resource or a different resource and uh, you, you're applying for an ECSE that at the end of the ECSE you would be able to exploit Archer. What this doesn't fund is scientific research. So that's quite important because um, the, the panel looked quite closely. I mean, there are other ways and other research grants for obtaining scientific funding. And the panel will often refuse a proposal if it appears to be trying to do research through the back door. It's all about 
book is in on the cords. So the new community section, for those of you that maybe looked at the application form, there's an option to identify yourself as a new community. Now, the funding is available for both new communities and established archer communities. If you're from an established community, we encourage applications and we fund a number of these applications every time. So, um, you know, it's not an either or, but we're all, we are encouraging proposals from new scientific communities. What do we mean by new scientific communities? This is specific, from, specific to the scientific area. So a new, new scientific area uh, or a new scientific community. It's not specifically about a new code or about new people, although they often come with it. So it could be, for example, someone who is currently using uh, regional resources and needs access to larger compute power. We do get a few questions about whether something is a new community or not. One of the tests is really to look at the established uh, Archer uh, consortia, which you can find on the website, and see if you fit. If you fit within the remit of one of those consortia, then you're not really a new community. If you don't, then you, you almost certainly are. So new codes to Archer are not necessarily scientific new scientific communities. Um, it could be a new code that forms part of an established consortia. And if you do think you're part of an existing, or you fit the remit of an existing consortia, we would encourage you to contact them um, to ask about joining. So the panel will read through the information. If you choose to identify yourself as a new community, they'll make an assessment as to whether they think you are or not. However, if they decide that you're not, it, they'll, you'll simply be considered alongside all the existing community proposals. So it's not as if your proposal will be rejected or anything, it'll just be um, looked at in a different category. I should maybe also say that with the new communities, uh, we're, we're happy to offer advice on whether you're a new community or not, but in the end it's the panel's decision. They look at the text you supply and, and it forms part, it's part of the, the assessment process. We don't control that. Okay, so a, a few bits of information about the ECSE. We have three regular calls per year. So they come around reasonably quickly. You'll find that they come around very quickly. And so if you're not quite ready this time, you know, there, there is a, another call around the corner. So this call closes at 4 p.m. on Tuesday the 15th of September. And most of the projects request between three and 12 months. You can request more, you, but that would be regarded as an exception. So if you are thinking of requesting more than 12 months, you need to really be clear and justify why you need that extra time. More often than not, the panel would look to say, well, we could fund 12 months, and then you should apply for follow-on funding if you need more time. And the funding is all for a staff effort, or the vast majority of it is. Now, you can request funding for staff located um, at your own institution, i.e. at the institution of the principal investigator. You can uh, request effort from someone who's based at a different organization. Or you can request some effort from the centralized CSE support team, that does, or a mixture of the above. If you're looking for centralized CSE support team, uh, strong, I would strongly encourage you to contact us in advance to get input as to whether we are able to do the work and the time scale. The, it's worth noting that the ability of the technical staff um, or the ability of the technical staff to complete the work is part of the assessment process. The panel will look and see whether they think the person has the skills to do the work. Now, you know, not everybody has absolutely perfect expertise. So what the panel also look at is they look at any training plans that are included and also the experience of any PIs and co-Is, any principal investigators and co-investigators. Um, co so if you know, for example, that the member of staff you're proposing and maybe lacks some parallel programming experience, it's best to put in a training plan to address that, and also if you have 
particular expertise in a group, um, you know, if, there's a, if you can have a co-investigator who can support them, then that obviously works well as well. We are committed to funding 14 FTEs per year, so, and the, the, the whole project is not for profit. Uh, so uh, any additional money that comes from the project will be put into further ECSDs. So we have a question from Heather. Okay, so can you request funding for a new position, for example, to bring a named researcher to a new institute? Um, you can, yes, are you asking, you can request, um, if you put in the CV of the named researcher, and if you are funded, um, they can be employed at a different institution, they could transfer institution. That's not a problem. I'm not sure, is that the question? If you don't have anyone in mind, if you're considering advertising, if I'm honest, I would rec you can do that, but I would recommend that uh, you look to name someone in advance because the panel will be wary um, of funding something without a named technical person. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. So this is just summarizes how the process works. So the call opens, so we're in that process just now. And if anyone has any questions, they should contact us just now during this period and we'll do what we can to help. Once the call closes, the first stage is what's called a technical review. So these are sent out to technical members of staff and I'll talk a little bit about this, but they're either members of the CSD team or some equivalents around the UK. And they go through the, the, the application and they also look to check that all the relevant information is there. After that, you'll receive an email asking for any additional information and given a set time to, to provide that. The information all then goes to the panel members. They carry out independent reviews. We have the panel meeting and um, the, an assessment is carried out and a list is produced of uh, successful projects. We then provide results and feedback and we do provide, try and provide um, constructive and helpful feedback. So the application process, after the call opens, your proposals will need to be submitted via the SAFE using, and um, this is specific, the ECSE funding calls page. So if you don't do anything else just now, if you haven't logged on to the SAFE, you need to be a registered user. Log on, have a look and see what needs to be done. Um, there is a form that needs to be filled in as well as the application. So try not to leave that to the last minute. Information and guidance for applying can be found at this URL. If you go and have a look, you'll also see a couple of examples of previous projects. And any advice, you know, any questions you have, come and contact the CSE team. Okay, so the, you need to, in terms of the technical effort, you specify the amount of effort you need in person months. And then you provide a costing. So this works very in a very similar to that. If you're coming from a university, I should say, it's very similar to say applying for money from EPSRC or NERC. You would go ahead and get a standard costing from your research grant offer. We pay 80% of full economic costs, which is similar to the research councils. There's no need to specify the cost if you request effort from the ARCH or CSE team, but you do need to include the, you know, note that you are looking for CSE team effort. We do, as I mentioned before, we do look at whether it's, uh, whether the finances are, are beneficial, whether um, it's cost effective for the project. If you're doing FEC costing, then really people cost as much as they do. So it's only when you come from outside the university system that we expect the cost to be similar to 80% um, full economic costing. And we also ask that you provide details of any existing funding for the proposed technical, candidate, technical members of staff. The reason for this is to make sure, A, that the work hasn't already been funded by a different project, and also to make sure that the staff member really is available to do the work. 
You'll see there's an option to identify a request for additional CPU time, additional time in the machine. So by default, each project is provided with um, 50 kilo EUs of CPU time per staff month. If you want more than that, then exceptional requests can be made. This is only for time though needed to complete the project objectives. objectives. So this is only time that you might need to carry out the work to develop the, the code. It's not, again not about doing scientific studies and the panel will look quite closely at things that say demonstrators and you know that kind of thing. That you're not trying to sneak some CPU time or some scientific research under the hood. There are other routes to requesting CPU time such as the RAP panel and if again if you have any questions about CPU time get in touch. So moving on to the next one. You can request travel funding for the technical members of staff. There isn't a huge travel budget associated with the ECSE and the general view is that they um, support existing research grants and existing um, groups which has its own travel funding. So funding isn't available for the PIs and COIs, it's, it's only for the technical members of staff. And we provide travel within the UK to meet the project objectives. In the vast majority of cases, this is either for meetings between partners or for relevant training activities. It's out of scope to request things to organise workshops or conferences or to attend conferences, even though I understand that is about impact. We usually fund, just to give you an estimate, we usually fund one trip every three to four months, but uh, you should just put down how much you're after and uh, try and justify that as to why you need it. And you should provide a breakdown of the travel cost. So rather than one large number, you know, you should explain why you came to that number. So provide travel costs by individual and by trip and an assessment, a very brief assessment as to, you know, this is X amount for train travel and this is for a hotel, that kind of thing. There's a request now for details of previous projects and proposals. So if, for example, you've had a proposal rejected in the past, some proposals are, have feedback in them that say if you address this, we would encourage you to reapply. So if it's a resubmission, the panel has the ability to look at the feedback from the previous one and see if it's been addressed. And they can also look at any previous ECSE projects you may have had, any successful ones, to see, uh, see whether uh, the work was successfully completed there and whether uh, this is a follow-on. Finally, it's looking for any related projects just to make sure that the work hasn't already been funded elsewhere. Okay, so how does the review process work? So there's two stages to the review. There's what are called technical reviews and then the panel's review. In terms of the technical review, first of all, there's a series of administrative checks carried out on all submissions. So we'll look at the submissions and make sure that the costs are clear, that all the staffing's in place, all the documentation's there, et cetera, et cetera. After that, the applications will be reviewed by what are called the technical advisors. Now, uh, they are, oh, and they are to centralise CSE team. The majority of these are carried out by our team here. The ones that aren't are ones that involve efforts from the CSE team. So, to avoid any conflict of interest, they are reviewed by a series of external advisors. And this is a group of people who are across five or six people across the UK who do these independently. Okay, I'll come to you in a minute, Anna, with your question. Um, so, yeah, so they're done separately. The technical advisors, I should emphasise, do a technical review and pick up uh, some points that um, they want to feed back to you. So, for example, missing information or questions they feel are relevant to the panel. They're not actually involved in the assessment process. They don't sit on the panel and decide the outcome. How long does all this take? Okay, so once, once the closing date has completed, the panel meeting 
is around six to eight weeks after um, the closing of the of the the call, and then we try and get back to people within well within a week, but it's certainly within one to two weeks with the outcome. Okay, cool. So next one, next slide. So so. At some point during that um, six to eight weeks, you'll get a request back for further information. Now, if no information is required, you'll still get a note saying, you know, we don't require any further information. You'll be given the opportunity to respond. Uh, usually, it's usually a week you're given. Yeah, you don't, you're not able to update the original proposal, but you can submit an additional response. All this information is then supplied to the panel. Uh, which they can use for their assessment. In a small number of cases, uh, you know, maybe something comes up during this process, and you can, if you wish, choose to withdraw and submit to a later panel. So panel reviews and panel meetings. Each application is reviewed independently by two panel members prior to the, the meeting. They go through the, they base their assessment on the assessment criteria, which is in the, the the guide on the website on the website, and I'll talk about it in one of the next slides. As I say, panel meeting takes about eight weeks after the call is closed, or six to eight weeks, and the panel can decide to fund, not to fund, or to fund in part. Occasionally, the panel feels that one of the work packages, for example, is out of scope. And they may offer you funding without that workshop, without that work package. It's then up to you to decide whether you want to take it with that, or take that funding in part. We can also fund with requirements, e.g., suggest improvements. And again, it's up to you whether you want to take the funding with those terms. There's a robust complex of interest process, which very much mirrors the process used by EPSRC. And also confidentiality processes um, in place to protect protect everybody and the applicant. If anybody wants more details on that, feel free to contact me, and I can tell you um, the process. Something that's new this year, this 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 round, is we will we are hoping to have a small number of early career researchers present as observers. This is to give these people an opportunity to see how the whole process works which should help them when making future um, funding calls, either to this or to other funding bodies. There will be actually an announcement going out to the Archer website if people are interested in this. But here it's just to note that there's also some observers in the room. The assessment criteria, well, it's based on the applicants. So I mentioned they look specifically at the qualifications and the skills match of the technical members of staff, but they'll also look at how well supported they'll be through the PIs and the COIs. Uh, and again, if, if you feel that there's a lack here of expertise, then consider having a training plan, consider who your PIs and COIs are, and um, if need be, you can always request small amounts of effort from the CSE team to provide additional support. New communities justification, um, you need to, you know, the panel will look and see whether uh, any applications that say they're from new communities actually are. And then they'll assess the technical content. So they'll be looking to see that there's enough technical information provided. In that case, the more data you can give, the better. The more information you can give on current scaling on Archer, analysis of the problem, um, an understanding of why you think there's an issue and why and what you think you can do to change that. The more sort of profiling data or performance data you can provide, the better here. Benefits. So they look at why it's needed and what are the expected benefits from the work. Of course, obviously working on a code, uh, you then have the science and then potentially the impact. You're you know you one step in a chain towards the final outcomes. But they'll be looking to see that there is um, a benefit. We're also looking specifically to see the benefit to the Archer community. So be careful to articulate 
and you know what will happen to the code afterwards how will it be made available to your community and will it be available freely to the archer community or if, if there's a charge and um, how is that charge administered those kind of things there's a pathway to impact so we're looking to understand what impact the eventual maybe the science done using the code what what's the impact from that the work plan we're looking for an appropriate plan that shows that you've thought it out uh, these are not long projects and so it's important to to be clear as to how how you're going to divide up your time and finally the overall quality and objectives and the panel do look quite closely at objectives now we're keen on seeing a series of objectives if you look at the final report as well you'll see that you're actually asked to report against the objectives that you put in the original proposal okay things to remember specific benefit to the archer community so will the code be available in archer afterwards will it be freely available will it be available to a group of users is there licensing restrictions and also who do you see will use the code um, and who needs these improvements so applications often have letters of support from other scientists saying you know, I need this and you know I am looking for this additional functionality it'd be very useful for my science the objectives are important I mentioned that in the last slide it is difficult trying to provide objectives that are measurable and quantifiable if you can you should do and um, this helps travel we only travel only fund travel for technical uh, members of the, the team the staff members and we don't fund travel for conferences and workshops that's conferences and for organizing workshops there are cases where people meet as collaborators at a particular workshop you know that that's okay too the technical staff experience and profile is considered by the panel as do they look for um, existing funding to make sure the work is not um, being carried out under a different project. Okay, so the final decision will be sent to applicants together with feedback from the panel within around two weeks after the panel meeting. If for any reason your application is unsuccessful, we will provide constructive feedback. We take notes in the meeting and we we get feedback from the panel members if appropriate in some cases the the panel will encourage a resubmission they'll you know provide us with further advice and support and the, the, you know provide details as to what needs to be addressed to then prepare a resubmission it is worth noting though that once you make a resubmission it's treated in exactly the same way as a new submission it's a competitive process only the top projects are funded so even if you've addressed the feedback there isn't a guarantee that it will be funded a second time right? although quite a few of them are and um, if you need help uh, small amounts of help from the CSE team for example if you're struggling with benchmarking performance studies or if you need some advice and support dealing with any feedback that comes from panel members then you know the CSE team can help okay so um, I think that's everything I had to cover on the preparation and or you know on the submission process and what happens with, with applications so I'll I think Chris has, has a final slide or two on what actually happens if the project is successful Chris, Chris. okay so okay, thanks, thanks, Lorna. thanks Lorna. I'm checking earlier okay, okay right, good okay so we're just going to finish up by uh, giving a short overview of what happens if your project is successful um, so we thought this was useful to know um, so just so that you know what happens uh, when the, the project is accepted but also it's quite useful at the proposal stage so you can see what's required as the as a project progresses so if your project is successful um, if you first receive an email explaining the level of resources uh, and any conditions of acceptance together with any comments or feedback made by the panel. So once this is done, uh, it then goes to the contract stage. 
So we do set up contracts between the institutions involved, uh, and this is usually dealt with by a, a research manager or equivalent. Um, it's not something that you, that you as a PI or a technical staff have to worry about, but it, it's just to let you know that, that that's that is a stage in the process, but um, nothing is not to worry about. Um, so once that's all set up, uh, we then set up an Archer project for you uh, where we put your CPU hours in, and that's a project which is used uh, exclusively for the ECSE project. Um, uh, we also set up a named contact. Every every ECSE project has a named contact. Um, if, if you've got, if there's an EPCC member of staff already, you know, actually working on the project, then that would be your contact. Or if there's an EPCC co-I, they would be your contact, for example. Um, but it, in all cases, we do provide a named contact. So uh, even if EPCC are not actually involved in the project, then you will have somebody who you can speak with, um, and the liaise will do the project. <laughs> so, throughout the project, uh, we do expect there to be an en engagement of the technical staff with the with the Archer community. Um, that's usually what that really means is that uh, we would expect uh, ECSE staff to attend relevant training where appropriate, um, to attend the webinars, um, and just take part in any forums which come up, things like that, just to be sort of be active within the Archer community. So in terms of reporting, there are two kinds of reports. So there are what we call interim reports. These are basically quarterly re reports which are due every three calendar months, regardless of the, the, the level of uh, um, that you're actually working on the project. We require these every three calendar months. These are very lightweight. These just uh, just um, short progress reports just to check that everything's okay. Then right at the end, we have uh, a final report, which is required within two months uh, of the ending of the project. This consists of publishable and non-publishable parts. Um, so it consists of an impact section, which is uh, quite important for us, as we, we need to, to be able to, to show what the impacts of the projects are and show that, uh, that the whole thing's value for money and so on. Um, and then it consists of a, of a sort of free-form technical part at the end, which you can use to write a more, a more technical summary, which is publishable. Um, and we put that on the web, uh, and that's actually, that people have found that quite useful in the past as a way of um, actually being able to you can actually refer to this you know, as you refer to a paper. Um, so that, that's hopefully useful. Um, and once the project is completed, you're required to give a webinar. So sort of in a similar style to to what we're doing now, uh, usually using the collaborate tool, um, we'd expect the the, the technical staff to give out uh, a webinar for anyone from the Archer community to come to. Um, and, and typically it would be the technical staff that would give that webinar, but the PI could be involved or it could be a, a, um, between the two of you. Um, and projects uh, are showcased on the web. So we, we put a summary of each project up uh, online uh, and you'll see a couple of them up uh, on the ECSE pages now. Um, we're we're gonna be adding uh, more over the next few weeks. Um, and in some cases, we turn these into case studies, um, or we can link to any white papers and so on. If you have a look, you'll see some examples of that. Um, so that's all I was really wanting to say. Um, so I think now the best thing is just to, to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, probably the easiest thing is just to type them into the, the chat box, um, or uh, you can, if you click on talk, you should be able to talk, but pro probably the writing them in is the easiest way. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks, Phil. Of course, even if you don't have questions right now, then um, you can email in at any time, just email the Archer help desk uh, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can with any questions about um, uh, any proposal that you, you have or any problems you're having submitting. Okay, I'll just give you a few more seconds to, to think of questions. <laughs> if not, then we'll finish up. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll just, oh, oh, yeah, okay, it's indeed typing.
No, <laughs> okay. No. That point. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, I will assume then that there aren't any questions just at the moment. I realise I've said what Thomas will went along, which is, is good. So um, do just get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and you'll know this, this webinar is recorded, so we will put that up online at some point if you want to go back over anything. So uh, thanks to you all for coming and look forward to receiving proposals from you in the near future. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>